Um, bum, bum, bum. um yeah no so but off the off the booze for like 10 days now doing the dry january yeah 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 still getting there still getting there but uh yeah that's it that's what i've been doing that's my new year's resolution is to just stop drinking for a whole one month <laughs> if you can believe that which is pretty wild i've got no new year's resolutions at all mm. i don't know i just feel like new year's resolution just takes fun out of things because it's always stuff like oh I'll go to the gym like lies i'm lying to myself yes, I, exactly. I'm, not, I'm not gonna do it like I know. yeah there's a whole thing of like why are you waiting till january why not just start now but mm. at the same time i think it's good to have a goal and a date and if you can stick to it it's all the discipline i mean essentially the reason why i'm not wanting to drink for january is not because i think i drink too much or anything it's more about can you do it yeah for me it's it's kind of do it's for me it's about power okay <laughs> it's about domination i'm trying to dominate myself essentially in a way uh you know physically dominate myself <laughs> there's other ways to do it <laughs> mentally <laughs> yeah. uh, that's so what that's, i'll be focusing on yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, by the way, for the folks at home, this will be the first... And so, this is the first episode we're recording in 2024. Mm. Uh, for the folks at home, it won't seem like it, because they'll have heard our other episodes that we recorded before Christmas. But we haven't seen each other in, like, I don't know, almost a month now, I think. I know, yeah. It's been about that? Yeah, well, before Christmas, mm-hmm. absolutely, yeah. But, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah cool Christmas. Ah, uh, boring, quiet, literally mm. no stories to tell. You had an interesting Christmas, because you were very sick. Yeah, uh, this Christmas, our family decided to give each other the gift of sickness. Nice. <laughs> and we all got sick. It was definitely, it was up and down. We were all sick, so we didn't really do much. Mm-hmm. Uh, then my... I would post the picture, the picture you sent me, which is like your neck swollen out to comically large size. Uh, I was like, I was literally like a chipmunk. It's yeah. Like one side of my neck, it was like the lymph nodes, mm-hmm. it got infected. Uh, the one thing so the lymph nodes is meant to like prevent infection yeah it literally had one job and that got infected mm-hmm. ain't so that just the way one of it blew up it's like a golf ball in my neck and then the other one went and it was literally like a chipmunk yeah, yeah I yeah. sent a photo and yeah it is, it is pretty funny it is probably pretty funny uh, yeah yeah at the I time it was up. very sore <laughs> yeah it looked incredibly painful it was yeah but uh, yeah so we had some ups and downs so sickness and then my toddler's grandparents cat died mm. so we had to have that fun conversation because it's the first Oof. time that she's experienced like death yeah you know so we had to like sit down and have the conversation which uh, didn't go great um so yeah. we, kind of, I, we sat her down and yeah. explained you know like when the body gets old mm-hmm. uh, like when you're very 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 old you don't have to worry about it the body gets old and it moves on you know mm-hmm. and we kind of explained the whole thing and she was like she was sitting at the table when we explained to her and we could see it, she was taking it in and she was processing it and then she she looked at me and she was like so, is baby Keith dead? <laughs> it's like, it's like, oh God, something's gone completely wrong. <laughs> I was like, I thought it was like very profound. It's like, yeah. oh, she's recognised that my inner child is wow, dead. Wow, <laughs> that's pretty good. That's deep shit. Yeah, but like, it, but what really happened was she was looking at, I didn't realise, but throughout the week she was looking at old photographs, some of me when I was a child. Yeah. Like, I was like, oh, that's me when I was a baby. That's baby yeah. Keith. And she was like, but where's Baby Keith now? And yeah, then she's like, right. Baby yeah. Keith's dead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. he's fucking dead. <laughs> <laughs> so she's very confused, and uh, yeah, can't wait to pay for that therapy session when she's older. But uh, well, you'll probably need therapy already because she lives in a haunted house. Mm. Has the ghost returned? Uh, no, we oh, had. Uh, he went on holidays for Christmas. Yeah, it was. It's, Fucker. You know, like he might, he might have, but I was so like out of my mind with sickness that he's probably like doing all sorts. And he was like, I don't give a shit. Yeah, I, I don't care. <laughs> <You're> so she <laughs> knew. It was like ibuprofen coming out my ears. Yeah, I was like I don't know what's happening. But uh, yeah, no, it's been quiet on the old haunting front. But Damn. Uh, although you did have, I suppose your your last experience was pretty good. Oh, the door. Yeah. yeah. That was, yeah, that was pretty scary. Mm-hmm. That's still like it's it, a good one. Ingrained. In my, yeah, it is. Yeah. I know. I we okay. So. <laughs> I think we've said this a lot of times that we want, we're going to record an episode, mm. video record an episode of the podcast yep. in your attic. So I think we're, I, I don't want it to be one of those things we keep saying and then never do because mm. I'm always fucking doing that. So we will set a date, probably like next month we'll do it because this month's yeah. a little bit busy. Yeah, I, I do, we, we had a quick conversation about it earlier. So I think mm-hmm. we're going to do it second half of February. Second half of February. Um, yeah, yeah, we'll post it on the YouTube channel. That chapter podcast dot yep. freaking whatever. Uh, yeah, so give it a go, folks. Absolutely. And check it out. It's going to be great. All right. So will we get into today's episode? Yeah. All right. Let's do it. Let's do it. Guys, we're just fucking going to get into it, right? <laughs> we're just fucking going to get into it. <laughs> That's how normal podcasters talk. Not us who don't have a clue what we're doing. That sounds good. You know what? Actually start doing, start we should start okay. being like actual podcasters. Yeah, we should like start throwing in some sound effects. Then. <laughs> uh, I don't know what other podcasters do. Um, You have to do like that. And in today's episode, we're going to talk about the story of Lisa Halliday. Welcome to Network Studios. That's how that's how a real podcaster nice. should yeah, sound. Yeah. You know, sit, do you like down, the grab yourself a cup of coffee? Yeah. yeah. Do the cereal? Do you want to do the cereal thing? 
What's the serial thing? It's, you know, the podcast Serial. It was yeah. like the very. It was like the big true crime podcasts. It was like over ten years ago. No, you never heard of Serial. Oh, I've heard, wait. I think it's 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 a woman, right? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I listened to one series she'd done. It was actually very good. Yeah, yeah. yeah there was the first one was the um, the guy in Baltimore who definitely kills that mm. woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's like fucking hell. He definitely killed her. It's like, it's <laughs> like, oh my god, wow. Yes, killers can also be charming and likable, yeah. and uh, can also <laughs> like charm you, the narrator yeah. and the one... investigator, into believing what they want you to believe. It's, it's like that's what a killer is. <laughs> yeah, but that's the, that's what I was doing impression of. Yeah, so we should start sending like that. We should. We might get more listeners. So I'm gonna say I'm gonna start. Okay. I'm, I'm going. I'm, I'm diving head in. Where are we right. starting? <laughs> listeners, I can already hear the listeners tuning in this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, okay, no, forget. Uh, hey, you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this whole episode of the That Chapter podcast, I'm once again joined by Kitty Cat, Dirty K, Big K. I don't even know what I'm going I with anymore. I have no fucking yeah. idea what I'm supposed to call I think, I think I've said it before. Like, I've never had a nickname my whole life, and now I have several. Thanks. Oh, yeah, to people you, actually so. emailed me some shit to share with you. Um, with me? Yeah, goddamn. So for no, I goddamn it myself because for I, we record these like in the evening, and I'm usually like really tired because uh, I've been working on the videos all day. Mm. Um, I can't remember what people sent me. Dead air. Dead air. Uh, bear with me. Uh, okay, so I got some. Sp- oh, thanks everybody who sent in their spooky stories. Uh, we actually got a load. Like this oh, will cool. actually probably have to be a two parter. It's it's quite long. Yeah, I, okay. we got a lot more than I was expecting. Okay, that's great. Uh, I was just expecting like a paragraph. <laughs> People yeah. were sending me like essays, <laughs> okay, uh, nice. like multi-page essays. Yeah. I mean, it's great. Don't get yeah, me yeah. wrong, but uh, we'll probably have to do a two-parter or something. And here we go, another one. Um, there you go. Thanks, uh, Brock, who sent that in. Appreciate you, uh, Keith. Just talk about something while I'm looking this up. Um, <laughs> it's very hard having conversations with yourself, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, this is a bad idea. Um, anyways, people have sent me in something about you. I should probably forward on to you when they do, but I okay. I just don't. So, okay, wait, you know, here we go. Okay, I found one. This is from Cameron McMillan, the RIP markers in Keith's house, episode 56. We talk about them in every episode, so episode 56 yeah, yeah. means nothing. Uh, hi, Mike. Caught the bit uh, on this week's podcast where Keith's trying to find more information about the grave markers in his house, and a couple of ideas popped up regarding them. There is the possibility that they're not grave markers, but rather cenotaphs or similar. Okay. Um, I don't know what a cenotaph is. Do you? No. Okay. Uh, include dictionary definitions, folks, for the big words, because you're doing it with two, uh, two small brains here when you send this in. <laughs> That's a big word. Uh, yeah. No, he said, uh, anyway, to check the parish records, which I believe he did. Uh, I haven't gone. No, I went to the library to try and find the parish records, and they didn't have them, so I actually have to go into the church oh, to get them. okay. Yeah. Right. So you're like, I hope to have a mirror. And then you're like, all right, I give up. Yeah. <laughs> Almost immediately. It's on my list. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, yeah, the church. There you go. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, thanks, Cameron, for sending it in. So what uh, What was the name of that thing he said it could be? A cenotaph? How do you spell that? C-E-N-O. Oh, okay. I already started off with an S. Okay. Is this it? A cenotaph is an empty tomb or monument erected in honor of a person or group of people whose remains are elsewhere. It can also be... The initial tomb for a person who has been. Uh, this is blah, just blah, 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 great blah. podcasting mm. we're doing right now, by the way, uh, folks. So I, I'm really glad that you know you're you're getting your money's worth. Not that we bad. <laughs> Thank God we're not getting you've paid got, for this. <laughs> know, you've gotten to the Google definition of the podcast. <laughs> okay. We should just be a Google podcast. That'd be good. Right now, do you want to like Google things and be like, you just send us in words and we'll Google them. We should probably get to our story. Uh, <laughs> I guess <laughs> try and get around to it. <laughs> now he's checking his phone. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, was, I was checking the time. I was like, how long, we, how long is this intro? It's time for you to start being a podcast co-host. <laughs> All right. Uh, so in this whole episode, we were talking about a woman who has literally been dubbed the worst woman on earth. And I didn't realize this episode was about my wife. Hey, hey. Er, er, see, this is where we need the sound effects to come in. Er, yeah. er, 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 er. <laughs> oh, I think I have it on my phone. Oh, sweet. Uh, I always have it here just in case. Just in case. Just in case. Just in case. Here's, here's the out. moment. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> nice, very nice, my friend. That worked out really well. Perfect, man. You can tell we haven't podcasted in a while because we're eleven minutes in and we've talked about absolutely nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get to some murder. Okay, all right. Lizzie Halliday is who we're talking about today, and her name has become synonymous with female serial killers in general. Her crimes were that notorious. She's one of those women who you might not exactly know what she did, but her name likely rings a bell. Even before I started researching into this one, I'd heard the name. Lizzie Halliday, I didn't know what she had done, but I was like, ah, she sounds like a killer. Hmm. 
Um, Lizzie is one of the very first serial killers, female serial killers, and she was so bad with a capital B, at one point they even considered her a suspect in the Whitechapel murders attributed to old Saucy Jack. He comes up a lot. He does, yeah, I know. Had, yeah, it seems to be like the last couple of cases we've done now. It's, Every time. Yeah, fucking so, Saucy Jack. Yeah. By the way, I don't think we're ever going to cover him. Spoiler alert, because it's, yeah. it's been done to death. I don't oh, see any yeah, point yeah. in us covering yeah. Jack the Ripper. Well, we should just cover everyone who uh, has been like like theorized could be. So mm. it seems to be like every case from the eighteen hundreds. We'll probably we eventually get it right then. Yeah, true. Very, yeah, very true. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's give it a go. Cool. Let's do it. So let's go back and begin at the very beginning with the birth of Lizzie Halliday. Though that's not the name she was given when she was first brought into this world, of course. The day she was born and that regrettable event took place in County Antrim on the island of... On the island of Ireland. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. In Northern Ireland, to be specific, sure, don't you know? Northern Ireland, to be specific, there, now, don't you know? Oh, fuck, I can't. That's I can't pretty remember. good. That's, that's pretty good. All right. Antrim is one of six counties that make up Northern... Okay, no. <laughs> uh, that make up Northern Ireland. And, um, you know, they've had Northern Ireland, whatever. They've had, you know, their... Their cheekily troubles and mm. cheeky troubles up there. Antrim, it's home to Belfast City, where the unsinkable ship that uh, that sunk was built. <laughs> wow, way to go, guys. <laughs> the Titanic was built there. Uh, the Giant's Causeway is there. Bushmills Whiskey, which is a good old whiskey. That's from yeah. uh, that area. Yeah, my favorite whiskey. One of my it's good whiskey. Yeah. Uh, it would be probably my one of my favorite whiskeys, too. I like the, the Bushmills single malt. The, the ten year single malt. Oh, oh, that's, that's a really yeah. good. Oh man, that's. Are we yeah. having a whiskey podcast? We should. What's your favorite whiskey? I'd say. Well, I think it's also that one, or I like that one because it's really nice, but it's also cheap. Mm-hmm. And then, but I really, really like Redbreast. Redbreast is good. The fish, wait, is it ten or fifteen? I thought you liked the twelve. The twelve, 12, 12, year, 12 year one is good. Is good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that is really good. Yeah. My favorite whiskey, Teelings. Yeah, you do. Like I tealings. love Teelings. Yeah, tealings I think it's nice. the best. Teelings, yeah. if you're listening, sponsor me. Give me all your free whiskey. You don't even have to pay me. Just give me whiskey. I'll happily <laughs> accept it, even though I'm not drinking right now. <laughs> Why wouldn't they do it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm sure Mr. Teelings is listening to our podcast. Of course he is. He's a huge fan. Uh, so that's the where. And now to the who. And that would be one Eliza Margaret McNally. Though that wouldn't be the name she'd go on to make famous, being much better known as Lizzie Halliday. How she got to that name, we'll get there eventually. Little Eliza was born in Antrim somewhere around the end of the 1850s and early 1860s, but like many at the time, she didn't stick around. It wasn't exactly her choice, as she was somewhere between the ages of 3 years old and 8 years old at the time. Uh, This is, you know, records around this time, especially among the poorer classes, are not exactly the best kept, so it's difficult to be 100% about these dates. But where they can't be verified by official documents, we'll just kind of wing it. The records are like, they're definitely like extremely patchy. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Especially, like, talking about 150 years ago, yeah. Mm. From what I gather, it's definitely sometime in the, I feel like the early 1860s when Mm -hmm. she moved to the US. Yeah, yeah. As a young and Lizzie and her family sailed to the New World. Mm. Sailed to America. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And did, absolutely. Yeah, Yeah. they did. (laughs) Yes, very good. (laughs) I wouldn't say it was easy. Like, she went over with, like, nine siblings, I think it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. Something like that. Like, when they arrived, New York was just like a melting pot of mm. immigrants and the Irish were not welcome over there. No, uh, this is exactly it. They arrived in New York City, and um, this is like Gangs of New York mm. era uh, Manhattan. So you had, you know, riots, butcher bill, slums. Mm. Uh, it was pretty, pretty shitty. Yeah, it's a bit of a shithole, if you ask me. Not a lot of prospects for the no, Irish. No, I think we, all the Irish made it worse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, one thing we do know for sure is that in 1879, Eliza got herself a husband, something that would become something of a hobby for our gal. Her first victim slash husband was a man known as Charles Hopkins, though his real name was Ketspool Brown, which I can see why it changed it. Uh, that name would would piss me off too. Not a great name. I've no. never even heard of a first name, Ketspool. No, I, I just had a curiosity because I'd never heard of it either. I googled it. Mm. And literally, Ketspool Brown is the only <laughs> Ketspool that comes up. Ever. <laughs> this never comes up anywhere else. I swear to God, it's like made up. Or like his parents had a typo in his birth yeah. certificate. Why would he keep it then? Unique. Lizzie was estranged from her family and had been traveling around the East Coast with a bunch of other travelers for some time when she met Hopkins slash Brown in Pennsylvania. There's not a lot on record of, of uh, Ketspool over here, but Eliza and Charles did have a son together. Again, details kind of shaky. 
Charles was a native of Greenwich, New York, which I'm sure you can guess was and is a world away from the mean rolling hills of Antrim. Charles, however, he won't be featuring heavily in this whole one, as he wasn't really much of a chapter in Lizzie's life either, dying a seemingly natural death just a couple of years after they wed. Though obviously, given what we know now about Lizzie, looking back, it's not much of a stretch to think there was more, you know, at play than just a dodgy ticker. There's also no proof nor contemporaneous allegations of anything untoward. So, for the sake of it, let's just say that Lizzie's first husband, good old Ketsu, our, our buddy Ketsbul, may have just died in natural causes. We won't lay this one at her feet. Okay. Just plenty to lay at her feet. Okay. So we can give this one to natural, <laughs> natural. causes. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> you were looking at me when you're very pissed off. He's hot right now. He's not happy about this. <laughs> I'm up here. Man. Oh, man. He's a 10. He's at a, he's at a 10. <laughs> I thought we were talking about, I thought about the murder show. <laughs> <laughs> it's a natural causes show. <laughs> Lizzie didn't hang around, wasting time grieving her lost love for too long at all. And in 1881, two years after she married the short-lived Ketzbull, she rebounded herself into a brand spanking new- Yes, yeah, slay queen! Don't let Ketzbull hold you back, go on, get a new guy! And she did! She was looking for love, she was looking for life, and this time around, she found it. New beau, pensioner, ding ding ding, Artemis Brewer. Nice, get a girl. By the way, Artemis Brewer, second husband, Ketspool Brown, why are all her husbands sound like Harry Potter characters? <laughs> they do. Actually. This is a bit weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like fucking hell. It's also it's a good pub name as well. Art that is kind of a good yeah. name. It sounds like it sounds like a pub in Harry Potter. Mm, you yeah. get like mm. uh brew potions of um fucking magic newt tail or whatever they drink in Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah. I can't remember. I have no it's idea. Been, it's, it's been a while since I read it. Yeah. Oh no, the butterbeer. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sure there's pretty Harry Potter nerds who are like screaming at the radio <laughs> like, you fools! Like, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Artemis, he did a fantastic imitation of Charlie slash Ketspool, and he died a little over a year after their marriage. Now, I know what you're thinking, big dog, but hang on a second. There is no evidence to suggest anything fishy about this one either. I'm going to chalk this one up to natural causes. Just because, you know, it's the second of Lizzie's husbands to die within three years, and she would go on to be convicted of horrific crimes later, you can, you know, slow your roll. Slow mm. your roll. Okay, okay. And to be fair, there really isn't any evidence that either her first husband or her second died of anything other than natural causes. Maybe Lizzie was just a nightmare to live with. And she, yeah. The sweet relief of death was just... The easier part for these lads. They welcomed, you know, the shred of death with open arms. Uh, yeah. with sweet oblivion yeah. to get me away from this. Quite well, on our own terms. Yeah. Like, she, she was known to have a violent temper, uh, like, mm -hmm. since she was a teenager. And she would get into, like, multiple physical altercations. So, she does sound very toxic and a bit of an effort to be around, mm. I think. Oh, she's like a headbanger. Or, as I said, like, maybe they did die from natural causes. Like, I know the, the average life expectancy in America in the 1800s was, like, 40. Mm -hmm. So... Like, if you got sick, all the doctors could really do was, you know, a bit of bloodletting to get rid of that nasty blood we have too much of, apparently. Then just pump you full of opiates and send you on your merry way. Yeah, exactly. You'd be fine, probably. Yeah, so, like, it really wouldn't be beyond the realms of possibility that Lizzie lost two husbands so quickly. Mm -hmm. So, she may not have done it, but I guess in a very more real sense, she probably definitely did. I think she did do it as well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So then, uh, once again, Queen Lizzie quickly jumped into marriage number three, not long after the death of husband number two. Before the body was even cold, she'd found a new man, Hiram Parkinson. Again, he's literally another Harry Potter character. Dumbledore's bitch, yeah. Yeah, that's it. What? I don't know. D Dumbledore's bitch. <laughs> okay. <yeah. laughs> like with the first two, uh, once again, not a great deal is known about Hiram, including where he disappeared to, because, uh, yeah, literally three weeks after their wedding, if you can believe it, poor old Lizzie was abandoned and left to fend for herself by her devil of a husband. Fucking hell, look at these guys, mm. they keep dying and leaving her. Poor woman. I know, right? We got two dead, one missing. Um, now is kind of a time when people get a bit suspicious and maybe time to stay away from Lizzie McNally, but, um, no. She found husband number four very, very quickly again. Number four was a man named George, thankfully, George Smith, finally a guy with a normal fucking name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a name you can set your watch to. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, that's a good strong name. This is turning into a, a top ten video, you know. Number four, George Smith. Hiram, you know. <laughs> George Smith was a Civil War veteran just like Artemis Brewer. In fact, that was what connected George Smith and Lizzie in the first place. See, George had served in the Union Army with Artemis Brewer, 
Lizzie's second husband, and had actually proposed to Lizzie out of some misplaced sense of responsibility and chivalry. Couldn't have a woman, you know, be unwed. What is she, a slut? <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course she can't be unwed. <laughs> <laughs> They're the only two things. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. There's, no, there's no middle ground there. Lizzie, flattered by the pure-heartedness of George Smith's proposal, immediately shocked everyone by being a very sweet wife. Nah. <laughs> it seems Lizzie got fed up with George being an all-round good guy and decided to spice up his tea with a little drop of arsenic. Somehow, husband number... Five again. It was just, no. This is husband number four. I, oh, I'm, yeah. Yeah, I'm getting confused now at this point. <laughs> husband number four, George Smith. He actually managed to survive this attempt on his life, and he made a full recovery despite suffering horrific effects from the poison. Arsenic. Um, it's a really horrible way to die. Um, it's gonna be one of the worst. It's a hell of a carcinogen. So even if it doesn't kill you like in the short term, like immediately, it can kill you years, years later, and much slower. I believe like, during the 1800s, arsenic it was used so often to kill people that it was actually nicknamed the inheritance powder. The forensic toxicology, they didn't really have an accurate way of detecting the presence of arsenic in a corpse. So people, they were literally getting away with murder. But that did all change in 1832 um, when police, they, they arrested a man for lacing his grandfather's coffee yeah. with, with poison. And there was an English chemist called James Marsh and he tested the drink in his laboratory and he did confirm the presence of arsenic. However, by the time of the trial, his sample had deteriorated so, so, so much. So without forensic proof, the murder was acquitted. So Marsh, he devised a, a highly sensitive method that could stand up better in court. Mm -hmm. uh, this became later known as the Marsh test. And from 1836, it won worldwide acclaim and became the standard procedure. And that me method, it actually helped solve another 19th century female serial killer case. Yeah. Uh, Marianne Cotton, she poisoned and estimated like 21 people with arsenic. Wow. It was, it was, that's actually a good story. But uh, yeah, so thanks James Marsh for uh, solving all those arsenic. All problems. right. Yeah. Thanks Marshy. So anyway, needless to say, you have to really hate someone to do them away with arsenic poisoning. Um, but Lizzie probably didn't even care enough. She just wanted him gone. She didn't care enough to hate him. This was technically the first time Lizzie had tried to kill a husband. Or at least the first time people caught on to her being anything more than a simple housewife whose life was blighted by tragedy. George, of course, he didn't take kindly to the effort. Now, Lizzie wasn't stupid. Evil, but not dumb, and had already done a famous midnight flight, but not before loading up with plenty of her soon-to-be ex-husband's possessions, and for a short time with her pockets full, she went to ground, and she played it safe. Naturally, though, Lizzie wasn't going to stay quiet or single for long. She had a pathological need to swindle and to harm people. What exactly she was up to around this time is unknown, but no doubt she was enjoying the fruits of George Smith's labor until the money ran out and she needed to replenish and resurface. Lizzie, still going by McNally at this point, despite technically being still married to George, popped up in Vermont. And it should be noted, she was dragging her son, Ketspool's son, by the way, her first husband's son, around with her this entire time. There in Vermont, she'd met a new man, called Charles Playsteel. The marriage was pretty uneventful, luckily for Playsteel, and he got off rather lightly with Lizzie skipping the murdering and going right to the Robin run. Just two weeks into the marriage, Charles was left with empty pockets and once again, a Lizzie-shaped hole in the wall. Hmm. Which is probably a bit, I guess, after her last failed attempt. Yeah, she's like, I'm not gonna try that again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably yeah. Like, damage your ego a little bit. It's like, maybe I'm not as good at murdering as I thought yeah. I was. Oh no! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I need to get back up on that horse. Start <laughs> yeah, killing yeah. people again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, don't let it. You can't keep a good dog in. <laughs> so for anyone keeping count, Charlie Playsteel was husband numero five, though. After fleecing him for all she could, Lizzie was set for a short time and bounced around until she turned up again, having made her way from Vermont to Philadelphia. There, she'd managed to worm her way into the good graces of an odd oh, shiz an Irish immigrant family. Who, who took her in? The, oh. Mc, the McQuinlans. Jeez, or the McQuinlans. Oh, the McQuinlans. Oh, stroke a look there, eh? You have to sound more Irish than we do, Keith. Because nobody <laughs> thinks that we're Irish. <laughs> As my Irish accent is pretty good. That's, uh, no, no. That's fine, not great. She's rumoured to have some acquaintance with the family from back in Ireland. But um, given how young she was when she left for the States, which she was probably like, what, three to eight years old, it's more likely the, the uh, McQuillans were family friends of her family, the McNally's, mm. um, that kind of connection. That's how, how they would have known each other. Lizzie was no longer going by her old name of Lizzie McNally. 
she'd somehow landed on Maggie Hopkins and had used the money she'd collected from her philandering and her previous husbands to set herself up with a little shop. Even with the obvious opportunity to get on the straight and narrow, staring her right in the face, if she set up a little shop, she'd be set for life. Lizzie just could not bring herself to not get up to mischief, and instead decided she'd quite like to burn down her own shop and claim the insurance. The decision made very little sense. It just goes to show you how out of her mind Lizzie really was. The The whole stunt was incredibly obvious as a scam from, from the start. While the rest of the country was drinking itself dry on St. St. Paddy's Day. <laughs> Man, I gotta stop doing the Irish accent every time something Irish comes up. <laughs> I, gotta, I, I find it very offensive, Mike. I know. I, I, hey, I'm offending myself. <laughs> So while everybody was getting hammered drunk on St. Saint, Saint Paddy's Day 18, maybe I'll do St. I think Saint it's called Patty's Day in America. Patty's Day, yeah. Patty's Day. Yeah. It's Paddy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 1888. I don't know. Just St. Patrick's Day or Patrick's Day or March 17th. We just, we just call it that. Just get drunk, right? Yeah, how about you just get drunk? Have a laugh. That day, 1888, Lizzie was convicted of arson and sent to the Eastern State Penitentiary for two whole years. Shortly after her conviction... Her son was also carted off to a juvenile institution. Uh, apparently, uh, you know, growing up being dragged around from con to con with a violent, hard-as-nails sociopath uh, for her mother wasn't the best start in life. And it set him off in a bad way. Frankly, had he turned out anything but a hardened criminal, it would have been a miracle. Mm. She, she, actually, she picked a crazy time to burn her shop down as well. She did it during the blizzard of 1888. <laughs> Great time to burn my house down in the middle of a snowstorm. I know, and it was, this was a bad one. So from March 11th to 14th, also known as the Great White Hurricane, like this storm paralyzed the East Coast. Mm. Telegraph and telephone wires, they, they snapped and they isolated New York, Boston, Philadelphia, wa Washington for days. Yeah. And the blizzard, it caused more than 20 million in property damage in New oh. York City and killed more than 400 people. Wow. So while there was like 50 inches of snow falling outside, Lizzie decided now was the time yeah. To burn her place down mm -hmm. and head outside. That makes perfect sense. Yes, exactly. Nobody will expect it. I don't think this woman was in her right mind. Yeah, I don't think she knew what she was doing, but... I interestingly, Dick, this wasn't the only big storm um, of that year. Is this on a storm podcast? It's Stormwatch. <laughs> uh, this is actually an interesting one. On January uh, 12th, 1888, um, across the Northwest Plains region of the United States, a storm came with literally no warning. Some accounts say that the temperature fell like nearly 100 degrees in just 24 hours, and the storm ended up claiming the lives of 235 people. Wow. But it later became known as the children's blizzard or the school children's blizzard because the majority of people who died were children just trying to get home from school. Oh, I briefly have heard of that story. I think I'd thought about covering it once before. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a wild story. It's crazy. It's dark. It's a new year. I'm coming with harder, darker facts. Hell yeah, bro. We and go a, dark. And a sprinkle of sadness. We're going fucking dork. <laughs> dark, we're going man. dork this year, bro. <laughs> dork. So, not unusually, Lizzie didn't serve the full term and was released from prison the next year in 1889. Through all of this, Lizzie maintained contact and a friendship with the McQuillan family. Given all the awful shite Lizzie had done, uh, it just goes to show how well she knew her audience, considering not only was she not completely abandoned by her new friends, but she consistently found men to marry her. She could... Suck with the best of <laughs> <laughs> She was doing something right, huh? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, come on. What, what must that have been? <laughs> so once out, Lizzie changed her name once again. Now she was going by Lizzie Brown. And by the end of the year, she landed herself a job as a housekeeper for an elderly widower and farmer named, get this, Paul Halliday. Lizzie moved in with Halliday and his sons at the Halliday's home in Burlingham, New York. You know, he was a, he was a charcoal farmer. What's a... Don't... Doesn't... Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Yeah. Because when I looked it up, basically it involves the cutting down of trees, burning them. To get then, charcoal. Oh. And then you bury them. Ah. And then you get charcoal and you sell the charcoal. Wow. Wait, I, I never realized it existed. I just came across it. I thought it was kind of interesting. So. That is kind of interesting. Mm. Point to Keith. Thanks very much. Five points to Keith! <laughs> Naturally, Paul was Lizzie's exact target audience, and it didn't take her long to go from hired help to Lady of the Manor, marrying Paul and gaining the name she'd go on to make infamous. Because, folks, pretty much all of the story is kind of a prelude to what actually happens here mm. now. This is when the story really goes off the rails. So, Lizzie, being four decades younger than Paul, had a clear and obvious ulterior motive for wanting to formalize their union. Paul, on the other hand, 
was also not a great person. He was kind of a piece of shit, too. Mm. I mean, okay, obviously he's an old man. He wants to marry a younger woman, which is gross. Yep. Um, but he also had more reasons than that. So they lived in Burlingham. Uh, it's just outside New York City. And he was a, he was a charcoal farmer, as he said. <laughs> yep, yep. And he was also cheap as shit. Frugal would be the polite word, but Paul was known to not be very loose with his coinage. And um, he he kept his pension and his not insubstantial income from his farmland to himself. Basically, the reason Paul wanted to marry Lizzie, who was his housekeeper, was because, well, if he married his housekeeper, she would become his wife. And you technically don't need to pay your wife. Which, in fairness, sounds good thinking. I mean, aren't all wives kind of like housekeepers as well? <laughs> that one's for the for the wives out there. <laughs> I would love to hear what that conversation was. Uh, like, yeah. It's like, yeah. here's what we're going to do. We're going to get married. And you're going to love this. You're not going to get paid anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we have to have sex. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's pretty, pretty nasty. But uh, Lizzie, just seeing dollar signs, I guess, in her eyes. Mm. And she was like, great. I guess she's playing the long game. She got the money. She was playing the long game. She, yeah, yeah, exactly. Especially if he's keeping all the money, he's frugal with it. That's more money for her. He has a stash somewhere. Exactly. She'll get it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah, yeah. So little did he know, the decision to marry Lizzie would cost him a hell of a lot more than the few books it would have cost to, you know, have her around as a housekeeper. The newly minted Lizzie Halliday didn't take well to her new life and was prone to regular bouts of temporary insanity. Although that's, I mean, I think she was, the insanity was full blown in Lizzie at this stage. That's literally how her latest husband, husband number six, by the way, he described it. Little did he know just how off the wall she was about to get. Over the next two years, what started out as sporadic and unpredictable, but brief spells of uncontrollable behavior, including violence, escalated into more consistent and prolonged outbreaks until something in Lizzie snapped. What followed was a sudden explosion of violence that shocked the East Coast. But before we get into that, we should talk about how, shortly after the wedding, Lizzie's urges to steal anything that wasn't nailed to the ground took over again, and she and an unknown accomplice stole a whole team of horses and fled, trying to sell the horses. She was caught by then alone, no doubt having snuck out on her fellow horse thief. Lizzie got herself yet another stamp on her loyalty card at the asylum. Two more, she gets a free straight jacket, and Paul managed to have his wife returned to him, even when she was married and probably... You know what I mean? For good money, she just couldn't resist stealing yeah. horses and being up to just no good. Do what you do best, you know? Lizzie Halliday's most infamous moment followed in the May of 1891, when tragedy struck the household as Paul's disabled young son, John Halliday, was killed when the house suddenly burned to the ground. As soon as the smoke was spotted, the rumblings of how much Lizzie disliked John started to spread around the local community. Hardly anyone was unaware of Lizzie's reputation at this point, and after the fire, there was hardly a place she could go without hearing accusatory whispers. Lizzie claimed that John had died a hero, as he tried to save Lizzie from the fire and succumbed himself. Unfortunately for Lizzie, however, she'd clearly been relying on the flames to cleanse away the truth and leave no choice other than to believe her words. But the fire had, unfortunately for Lizzie, only done part of the job, in that it had certainly killed John, but the fire was extinguished before the house was razed completely, leaving the scene intact. And that scene showed investigators that not only had John not been trying to save his beloved mother-in-law when he died, but that he'd actually been locked in his bedroom and had died of smoke inhalation without ever having the chance to try and escape the searing heat of the fire. Furthermore, when his mother-in-law was searched, she was found to have been in possession of the key to John's bedroom. The evidence with the scene made the crime more of a two-piece jigsaw than competitive chess match, and it was pretty obvious what had happened. Despite this, however, Liz wasn't arrested for setting fire to the house and locking her son-in-law in the bedroom until she'd also managed to set the family mill and barn ablaze, and for good measure, she did another legger with another fella. Paul would say that Lizzie bragged him, about rolling John up in the carpet to ensure that he would die in the fire. Wow. Uh, but, like, I take a lot of what Lizzie says with a fairly big pinch of salt, but mm. it definitely was known that she hated uh, John. She didn't like him at all. Happy to see the back of him, or, well, the fucking gravestone of him. Yeah. However, this time when she again ran away, she didn't manage to get far and was captured and institutionalized once again. 
Shortly after being transferred to a different asylum, Lizzie managed to get herself declared legally sane and was returned right back home to Paul Halliday. Why he kept taking her back remains a mystery. That, that was dirty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I need someone to clean. <laughs> so shockingly, in August of 1893, Paul seemed to have vanished off the face of the earth. Lizzie insisted that her beloved husband, Paul, had taken some masonry work in a neighboring town, though no one was really buying it, and it was obvious to everyone, including Paul's sons, his remaining sons, that there was something more going on that they weren't being told. And honestly, it's surprising it took her husband this long to disappear. The sons of Halliday, smelling something fishy with the idea of their elderly pa suddenly taking a job he didn't need, decided to set a little trap for Lizzie and started a non-stop stakeout of their father's house. In the run-up to his sudden vanishing, Paul hadn't been shy in helping to fuel the story that Lizzie had been responsible for his son's death. Lizzie might have sensed the end of the marriage coming, and if that was the case, she'd be out in the cold without a pot to piss in. Paul's sons weren't the only ones, though, who had caught on to Lizzie. Their neighbours had also seen through her act at this point, and there were a few who didn't think she was responsible for Paul's Houdini act. Everybody knew she killed Paul's son, and then she'd likely kill him. After catching Lizzie in a lie, Lizzie had asserted that Paul had visited the house, but the brothers had been watching and knew he hadn't returned. Either the neighbours or the brothers, we're not exactly sure who it was, instigated a search of the Halliday property. Despite them being prepared for the worst, what they found still shocked them to their very core. On September 4th, 1893, during a search of the house, investigators found two bloodied bodies in the Halliday barn, neither of which belonged to Paul Halliday. In fact, the two discovered deceased bodies were, were two women. Once identified, it was obvious who was responsible for their demise. The two dead women were Margaret and Sarah McQuillan, mother and daughter of family friends. For now, Paul Halliday remained missing, but Lizzie was taken into custody for the McQuillan murders. The two women had been shot multiple times. It's unknown why she killed the two ladies, however, it's been suggested that Lizzie pretended to need a cleaner and offered Margaret the role, which, as a friend, you know, giving her a job and she jumped at it, only for Lizzie to kill her at the Holiday Farm and then call for Sarah after pretending that her mother had had, had an accident and needed help. And then when 19-year-old Sarah came to help, she too was shot to death. We don't really know why, though. Why why Lizzie killed her these family friends of hers at all? Yeah, I really, I, I couldn't figure out why. Um, the, the other murders, they appeared to definitely be, like, motivated by financial gain. Yeah, old um, husbands, of course. Yeah, and, like, her MO up to this point was to target older men, pensioners, and then wait for them to die. And yeah. when this didn't happen quick enough to her liking, she would then intervene herself. Yeah. Uh, however, these two women, they seem to just be, as you said, completely random. There are, there are some theories uh, that she was trying to get revenge on the head of the family, Thomas McQuillan. Okay. Because apparently back in the day, he had promised Lizzie's father a job which never materialised. Um, like Lizzie, her father suffered from mental Ill illness and would end up dying on the streets from insanity. Mm -hmm. So perhaps Lizzie thought that not getting the job is what led to her father her father's ruin. Ah, so she held this grudge for many years. Uh, right, yeah. But uh, again, this is all speculation. There's no concrete ev evidence against this. And, you know, it's not like the Irish to hold a grudge. No, you know, so. never at all. Wink. Definitely very out of character. <laughs> <laughs> So, from the moment the two women were found in the barn, Lizzie had fallen back into her displays of insanity. She was, she was pretty good at it by now, well-practiced, and knew exactly how to play it. The search for Paul came to a close with a grisly but expected discovery two days after the McQuillan women were found. Paul's body was found in a, buried in a very shallow grave beneath the floorboards of his very own kitchen. He had suffered an even gorier and more brutal death than the McQuillan ladies. Paul, apparently, had been attacked as he slept, first being shot and then smashed in the head with an axe. Good old axe murder, once again, ding, 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 for good measure. The wiry but sturdy and strong Lizzie then rolled his body from the couch into a hole, covered it with a slight layer of dirt, and then replaced the floorboards. She was there in the house the entire time, continuing to eat meals at the kitchen table, knowing that her dead husband was lying literally under her feet, under her guest's feet the entire time, which is as, uh, it's as messed up as it gets. 
in custody then, arrested for tree murders. Now, Lizzie, she began to self-harm. She would cut herself with, with broken glass, and when asked why she had done it, she would reply, to see if I would bleed. If she wasn't insane, she was doing a pretty good impression of it at this point. At one point, the sheriff's wife took pity on the seemingly delusional and self-hating Lizzie and tried to soothe her and calm her down during one of her spells of mania. Lizzie thanked the woman by trying to strangle her to death. She was only stopped when several men intervened and pinned her to the floor. They later described Lizzie Holiday as being supernaturally strong. Another of Lizzie's tricks was to starve herself. She went on hunger strike uh, to the point where she had to be force fed by a tube through her nose. Well, I can only imagine in the 1800s, it was less of a tube and more of a funnel. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Shoving porridge down. <laughs> Jeez, wow. Open wide. While awaiting trial, Lizzie actually became something of a notorious public figure after several outlets got a hold of her story. She was even interviewed by Nellie Bly, who herself had become a bit of a celebrity journalist back in the day after publishing her story, 10 Days in a Madhouse, in which she had gone undercover in an asylum and reported on the conditions patients were, were subject to. I remember, I think I watched a really good documentary once before Nellie Bly's story. Mm. It's, uh, yeah, it's going uh, insane asylums back in the day. Not great. Not good. Not great. No. Pretty nightmarish yeah. stuff. So some of the things they used to do in these, so like I said, like horrific. Uh, I know in the 1800s across Europe and North America, they used techniques like the swinging chair. Which, swinging chair? Yeah, it would let you just spin you around if you got <laughs> sick everywhere. <laughs> it was, I don't know, it was like the purifier. I don't know, it was the... Get the, get the sickness out of you. Get the crazy out of you. Yeah, I don't, like, I, I'm still not sure of the, the reasoning behind it, but they literally just spun you in a chair. Uh, one of the largest hospitals in Paris used what's called uh, the water douche which was basically a stream of cold water being directed on the butthole of a naked, seated, unsuspecting patient. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, okay, I'm, yeah. I'm fine now, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, and then, another... better, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you can stop now. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and there was another popular wa water treatment. Uh, it was called the Bat of Surprise. Oh, I like this one. <laughs> That's where the uh, patient was suddenly plunged into cold water which is, funny enough, has become popular again with all these ice baths. Ah, uh, yeah, it's like, I, yeah, people do that all the time. Yeah, uh, yeah. Apparently, you know, after training and stuff like that as yeah. well. Or the ice bucket challenge. Y yes. All exactly. these, yeah, all these things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, full, that's... full circle. I don't know how it was a surprise, though. Like, it, like I assume, like, they're brought in as like, what's that? Oh, don't, don't worry about that. Don't look at that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Close your eyes. Yeah. yeah you push did, did you see that? Pretend you didn't see that. <laughs> and you get. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, like, I know we're joking, but yeah, it was horrific. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, hey, listen, if you can't laugh about it, you know what I mean? <laughs> so the interview uh, Lizzie did with Nellie Bly brought to light many unconfirmed details of Lizzie's story, including the many, many marriages, including the overlapping ones. Lizzie Holiday's story ends with her name being etched into the record books, as she became the first woman to be sentenced to death in the electric chair in New York State. Though, that isn't how Lizzie's life was destined to end with the sentence finally being commuted and Lizzie being condemned to live out her days at the Madawan Hospital for the Criminally Insane, after she was deemed unfit for the original sentence to be carried out. Now, of course, if you know anything about such hospitals, as we just said, the idea of spending the rest of your life in an institute for the criminally insane versus being electrocuted to death, it's, um, f you know, flip a coin over, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's definitely saying a lot about the state, the mm -hmm. mental hospitals at yeah. the time. Do you know that the, the electric chair was, had only been invented four years prior to that? Really? Yeah. Wow. So, and the, uh, I, I think the first person Old to be... Old Sparky. <laughs> the first person to be electrocuted was uh, William Kemmler. And yeah, after like the initial 17 seconds of the disadministration of the high voltage electric current, a doctor declared him dead. Yeah. But then he let out a deep groan. And uh, yeah, and, it went, that oh, fucking <laughs> and the witnesses just screamed, turn on the current. And yeah, they turned it on for like another two minutes until the chamber was filled with the smell of burning flesh. Oh, so like they really fucking biffed that one. They man. completely botched it. And yeah. they, they continued to botch the electric chair executions right until the 90s. Wow. But like even with that knowledge of knowing how the electric chair executions get botched, I think I'd still take my chance with the chair than the mental asylums. Yeah. This time. yeah. Um, very astute point, Keith. 
<laughs> Lizzie earned herself a reputation as a model inmate, sticking to the rules and even forming a close bond with several of the nurses and staff at the hospital. That should have been the end of it, but then... One of the staff Lizzie had grown especially close to was a young woman named Nellie Wicks. The two got on famously. Very well. Until sometime in 1906 when Nellie Wicks suddenly... Get this, Lizzie. You'll, you'll, this will blow your mind. I'm going to be leaving my job. It's the last day together. It's been swell. Nellie was leaving the criminally insane asylum and was going to go train as a medical nurse. She wanted to go and work in a regular hospital. Lizzie was not too keen on that at all. She she was not blown away by this idea. She saw her favorite attendant uh, was leaving her. Betraying her would probably be a better word. And so Lizzie uh, cornered young Nellie Wicks in an empty, locked room, stabbed her over and over and over and over again with a pair of scissors she'd managed to steal from Nellie Wicks's belt. Later, when Lizzie was asked why she had brutally murdered her close friend, the only friend she had, Lizzie simply said that she tried to leave me. Ah, that's sad. It is. Oh. Yeah. Little tear. One <laughs> single tear goes down my face reading that. Like, f fuck this fucker. <laughs> <laughs> and that really was the end of the violence. And Lizzie lived out the rest of her days at the hospital without any major incident, probably because she was kept in a straitjacket the entire time. Lizzie Halliday finally died on June 28th, 1918 of Bright's disease, which is a kidney disease. In the end, she spent almost as much of her life in an asylum as she had outside of one. So ends the story, batshit story, of Lizzie Halliday. There you go, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I need a better closer than just stare at you. <laughs> no, no, it's like, I, I, I thought there was more. <laughs> no, oh, no, no, that's it, that's it. Uh... Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a little bit of an outro, but, you know. Yeah, I think mad, we're good. We're mad, good. Mad, mad story. Yeah, yeah, Lizzie, she was a deeply troubled and uh, yeah. dangerous woman. Absolutely. Um, she, some horrible things happened to her, for sure. She was didn't have life easy. She grew up very poor. Uh, she, I mean, she, she was an immigrant, but she'd also been living in America since she was, like, a young child. So yeah. I wouldn't call her, like, she, she wasn't fresh off the boat, like, yeah. she was doing this stuff. It's mad how she, like, she was American by then. Yeah. I know, I know at the time... The media like jumped all over the story because I think this was coming just off the wake of um, uh, Lizzie Borden. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was up, not far away, up in Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah, not 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 too far. So I know, like at the time, I think there was like the media was pulling out everywhere. But then, yeah, it was kind of forgotten from public consciousness for a while. Mm -hmm. Like I, I hadn't heard of her. I I, I didn't. Really I knew the, the name, but yeah, no, I I didn't know the exact story. Uh, I didn't mm. even know she was Irish. Yeah. Um. But yeah, you know, it's it's it's. Hey, listen, it's a hard world. That's it. That's you know, it. it's yeah. a hard world. It's a hard world, especially for 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 women. They have mm -hmm. a, they do have it tough. So Lizzie, you know, she just took the bull by the horns and she just killed a shitload of people. That is true. And yeah. uh, you know, power to her. You know, <laughs> that's what I say. Free Lizzie. Free Lizzie. <laughs> Free Lizzie. My boy. My girl, Lizzie. Um, but yeah, that, that event rounds up this whole episode yeah. of the That Chapter Podcast. Yeah. I enjoyed it. It's good I to like be back. It. It's good to be back. I feel like we all, we're off back. to a rocky start there, but uh, I feel like we, <laughs> we got into it in the end. I mean, that's all solved with editing, I believe. So Yes, the magic of editing. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so if it's, uh, just forget what I'm just saying right now. It didn't sound bad at the start. The editor made it sound good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it it, if, it's, if there was any shit parts, they've been cut out. <laughs> <laughs> and if it is bad, it's not us, the editor. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, never our fault. Yeah. <laughs> 100%. All right. Uh, you guys have been great. Thank you so much for listening. It means a lot to me and Keith. Mm -hmm. uh, remember, new episode of the That Chapter podcast out every single Monday morning. So check it out wherever in the world you are. Yeah. Listen, that's all I have to say. So, uh, you know, how are you? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what's going on in your life? I feel like I've been doing all of we, Me and Keith have been doing all the talking here. Um, you know, let us know how you are. Let us know how you are. Talk to your radio now. Uh huh. I agree. I agree with what you just said. Very good. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. All right. Keith, do you want to do your patented? I'll see you. All right. Thanks. But Eliza and Charles did have a son together. Again, details kind of shaky. <laughs> uh. Nice. <laughs>